Hello friends, welcome to UGC EPG Partshala. I am Suman Dash Bhattamishra, Assistant Professor of Law at National Law University, Odisha. And today, in the segment of Criminology and Social Legislations and Crime, I will be discussing the interesting module of a socio-legal understanding of the PCPNDT Act. So let me first introduce the topic to you. The Preconception and Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Act was initially known as the Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Regulation and Prevention of Misuse Act of 1994. By virtue of an amendment in the year 2003, the PNDT Act 1994 was then renamed as the PCPNDT Act. The primary objective of the amendment and the consequent change in nomenclature was to ensure that advanced technologies in sex selection and determination are closely monitored and regulated. While the earlier legislation PNDT Act of 1994 was equipped to deal only with prenatal diagnostic techniques like amniocentesis and ultrasound which are very frequently used for sex determination and abortions of female fetuses. The PCPNDT Act 2003 went a step further and it curbed the use of technology to predetermine sex selection even before the stage of conception. So what is the background and what was the social context of the PCPNDT Act of 2003? Of the many offenses committed against women, female feticide stands out as the worst. Notwithstanding existing punishment mechanisms, the moral blameworthiness in the case of female feticide is much higher than that of other offenses like culpable homicide and murder because a case of the former, a person is killed even before she is born. In fact, the child in the womb is killed even before she acquires a complete personality or a full body. Since prenatal diagnostic techniques play a very huge role in perpetuating feticide, the regulation of their use became necessary over a period of time. Originally, these techniques were meant to serve the purpose of determining genetic abnormalities, detecting congenital diseases or malformations or tracing other metabolic disorders. The objective of prenatal diagnostic techniques was and has always been to allow medical examination of the fetus so as to prevent it from harm or danger and to administer medication whenever and wherever necessary. However, over a period of time, the abuse and misuse of these techniques has been a matter of very serious concern. The most common ways in which preconception and prenatal diagnostic techniques have been abused are as follows. Firstly, determination of the sex of the fetus so as to encourage feticide in case the fetus is female. Using techniques to predetermine the sex of the child even before conception and the most common method of abusing preconception and prenatal diagnostic techniques has been in the context of female fetuses. Indian society is rife with social practices that are derogatory to the dignity of women. Associated with womanhood are a bunch of discriminatory social practices like the dowry system, matrimonial cruelty, etc. A girl child is considered as a social and economic burden for several reasons. The vulnerability of women to crimes like rape and sexual offenses, the system of dowry and the fact that after marriage women are considered to be part and parcel of the husband's family have contributed to the treatment of Indian women as economic burdens by their families. It is in this context that over a period of time, 
Indian households have treated the birth of a male, male child as a blessing, while female children are considered to be massive burdens. Since most Indian families started desiring for a male child under social pressures, prenatal diagnostic methods started being abused commercially on a very large scale. Doctors and physicians entertained couples who wanted to determine the sex of their child in the womb and abused diagnostic techniques and procedures for that purpose. Now, we need to take a look at the legal dimensions of the Act. The PCP Entity Act of 2003 serves the following very significant purposes in the context of female feticide. Firstly, it lays down the law relating to regulation of clinics and PCP and DT procedures. Secondly, the Act lays down guidelines for constituting boards and authorities. Thirdly, it prohibits selection of sex of the unborn child. And fourthly, prescription of punishment for abusing prenatal and preconception diagnostic techniques. The Act defines preconception and prenatal techniques under Section 2 as inclusive of both procedures and tests. Section 2K brings the following gynecological or obstetrical procedures within the ambit of prenatal diagnostic tests. First, ultrasonography. Second, fetoscopy. Third, procedure for taking or removing samples of amniotic fluid, chorionic villi or any other tissue or fluid of a man or woman so that the sample can be sent to a genetic laboratory or a genetic clinic for conducting analysis or prenatal diagnostic tests for sex selection either before or after conception. Section 3 of the Act states that the use of PCP and DT methods is legal only for detection of the following disorders. First, chromosomal abnormalities. Second, genetic metabolic diseases. Third, hemoglobin facies. Fourth, sex-linked genetic diseases. Fifth, congenital abnormalities and any other abnormalities or diseases as may be specified by the Central Supervisory Board. This section is important as it outlines the exact purposes for which the PCP and DT methods may be used legally. Use of PCP and DT methods for any purpose other than the ones enlisted above is illegal and not warranted under the Act. The reasons for making the use of PCP and DT methods as seen in Section 3 is to ensure the safe growth and development of the fetus in the mother's womb and to ensure a healthy pregnancy for both the mother and the child. Since congenital anomalies and genetic metabolic abnormalities of the fetus carry a lot of risk, their assessment and treatment depends on them first of all being detected. Therefore, PCP and DT methods may be used to detect the same and wherever possible appropriate remedies including abortion may be executed to protect the life of the mother or the child. Section 4 of the Act lays down a list of other conditions that can make the use of preconception and prenatal diagnostic techniques legal. The section makes it clear that these techniques can be used if the following factors are present. First, age of the woman being above 30, 35 years. Second, woman having undergone two or more spontaneous abortions or loss of fetus. Third, exposure of the pregnant woman to agents which can cause damage to the fetus like radiation, chemicals, drugs or infection. Fourth, pregnant woman's or her spouse's family history of mental retardation, physical deformities or genetic abnormalities. 
or fifth any other condition which has been specified by the central supervisory board. The law also makes it very mandatory for the above mentioned reasons to be recorded in writing, seeking and encouraging the conduct of prenatal diagnostic techniques or sex selection techniques by relatives of the pregnant woman, her husband or any other person is prohibited under the Act. The Act specifically mentions that tests can be conducted by the gynecologist, sonologist, radiologist or any imaging specialist. It also specifies that such tests can be conducted only within authorized premises like genetic counseling center, genetic clinic or genetic laboratory. Registration of such premises is mandatory, failing which conducting such tests in these premises will be considered to be illegal. Sections 18 and 19 of the Act, read with Rules 4 and 6, state that premises can be registered by making an application in Form A to appropriate authority. In large cities, the appropriate authority is Ward Health Officer and in towns, applications have to be sent to District Medical Officers. Under Section 5, the PCPNDT Act makes it essential to take the written consent of the pregnant woman before conducting any preconception or prenatal diagnostic test or procedure. So, now let's take a look at the implementation of the PCPNDT Act. So, what are the institutional mechanisms under this Act? For the implementation of the provisions under the PCPNDT Act, it is dependent on several institutional mechanisms. The Act provides for the Central Supervisory Board under Section 7, which shall consist of 24 members. The Minister in charge of the Ministry of Department of Family Welfare shall be the ex officio chairman of the board and the Secretary to the Government of India in charge of the Department of Family Welfare shall be considered to be the ex officio vice chairman of the board. Section 16 of the Act states that the board shall perform all of the following functions. Firstly, advising the central government on matters of policy regarding legitimate use of prenatal diagnostic techniques, self selection methods and prevention of misuse of such techniques. Secondly, reviewing and monitoring the proper implementation of the act and rules and make recommendations to the central government regarding changes that ought to be made. Thirdly, generating public awareness against preconception and prenatal sex determination. Next, creating a code of conduct for persons working at genetic counseling centers, genetic laboratories and genetic clinics. Then, overseeing the performance of bodies which are created under the Act and implementing necessary measures to ensure effective implementation, then also to perform other functions which may be laid down under the Act. Under Section 16A, the Act also provides for the creation of state supervisory boards and union territory supervisory boards which will inter alia perform chiefly the functions of creating public awareness against the use of PCP entity methods for sex selection monitoring and supervision of the implementation of the provisions of the Act. Apart from central and state supervisory bodies, the Act also makes provisions for appropriate authorities and advisory committees for further monitoring and supervision of the preconception and prenatal diagnostic techniques and methods. The appropriate authority performs the functions of granting suspension and cancelling registration of genetic centers, clinics and laboratories and lay down standards for their functioning. And this is also a very important provision. 
Now, what are the offenses and penalties under this act? This is a very relevant and important topic for discussion. Under the PCPNDT Act, owning or being an employee of an unregistered genetic counseling center or clinic or laboratory is a cognizable, non bailable and non-compoundable offense which is punishable with rigorous imprisonment for a term that can be extended up to three years and a fine of 10,000 rupees. Upon repeat conviction, the period of rigorous imprisonment can be extended up to five years and the amount of fine can be raised up to 50,000 rupees. Likewise, Section 22 prohibits advertisement of prenatal determination of sex. Now, we have to discuss a very important question. What is the impact of the PCPNDT Act on Indian society? One of the methods of bringing social change is the introduction of reformative laws in India. Female feticide in India has been rampant for centuries. Degradation in the status of women is said to have commenced in the later Vedic age and has taken a vicious form in modern times. Of several abhorrent practices against women like sati, parda, dowry deaths, domestic violence, etc., female feticide is potentially the most hazardous one because it has a severe impact on the consistently declining sex ratio in our country. Several provisions in the act have a deep-rooted connection with the practical aspects of the problem of female feticide. An analysis of such provisions is essential from the perspective of understanding the social context of the legislation. To begin with, the act prohibits and penalizes communication of the sex of the fetus to any person either by number one words, number two gestures or number three signs. This is directly linked with the social fact that in many parts of India and more rampantly in the northern parts, it is a common practice among medical practitioners to communicate the sex of the fetus to parents and relatives by using expressions like Jai Shri Krishna in case of a male fetus and Jai Ma Lakshmi in the case of a female fetus which indirectly refer to the sex of the unborn child. Similarly, the act makes the offense of misusing prenatal and preconception techniques a cognizable, non payable and non-compoundable offense for the purpose of deterring individuals from indulging in sex selection. For common people and especially for medical practitioners, the very idea of incarceration is sufficient deterrence. Although there is a possibility of escaping the clutches of law, but the fact that sex selection is a punishable offence helps in curtailing the prevalence of the crime and rampant abuse of prenatal and preconception sex determination techniques or methods among common people. Now, the Act also fixes personal as well as institutional liability, which means that individuals who are acting in contravention with the provisions of this law cannot take the benefit of being behind the corporate veil. It is important to note that under section 26 of the Act, if there is contravention of any of the provisions of the PCPNDT Act by any company or organization, there will be individual as well as institutional liability if the minimum mens rea of knowledge or connivance or consent is proved. The prescribed mens rea of consent, connivance or knowledge is at a much lower level than intention which makes it relatively easier to fix liability. This principle of fixing liability on the basis of a lower mens rea is based on the social fact that even indirect or remote connection with sex determination shall be punishable. Under section 5, the act makes it compulsory for medical practitioners to seek and obtain the written consent of the pregnant woman, not just the oral one, but the written consent before she is made to undergo any prenatal diagnostic procedure or method. 
socially, the consent of the pregnant woman was irrelevant before undergoing such procedures. On most of the occasions, the woman was even unaware of the nature and purpose of tests which were being conducted on her. Consequently, the family members and relatives of the pregnant woman, including her husband, either coerced or defrauded her to undergo sex determination tests and even ensured that the fetus was aborted in case it was female. On many such occasions, the woman was found to have been neither in favor of the test nor the abortion of the fetus. So, in order to give the woman a central role in determining whether or not she wishes to undergo a prenatal diagnostic procedure, it has been made mandatory under the act for the medical practitioner to inform the pregnant woman of the possible side effects of such procedures and to obtain her written consent. The emphasis on written consent in such cases is because of the factor of certainty which is attached to such form of consent. Under the act, there is also a bar on the communication of the sex of the fetus to any person even in the eventuality that the sex comes to the knowledge of the medical practitioner in course of the procedures or tests. The stringent rules against sex determination under the act have been laid down in order to prevent and discourage sex selection. Lack of awareness of the sex of the fetus is the only method of preventing the death in the womb of the mother. Although cases of infanticide are not rare, the purpose of the act is to ensure the prevention of feticide. Now another very important contribution of the act is that it has made registration of premises compulsory for carrying out prenatal and preconception diagnostic tests. The purpose of this provision is to prevent backdoor sex selection methods as well as procedures. Appropriate authorities have been created under the act and given the powers of search or seizure of illegal premises and investigation of complaints. Apart from that, they have also been given the authority to grant, suspend and cancel registration of the premises. This provision is particularly relevant in the Indian context with the widespread prevalence of illegitimate and illegal premises where sex determination is carried out by medical practitioners. So, it's time for us now to assess the PCPNDT Act. With all the positive aspects of the PCPNDT Act, there is still a very major drawback of the legislation. The Act is thoroughly dependent on institutional mechanisms for its implementation. While the presence of these institutional mechanisms can render the Act a very useful device to prevent female feticide, the absence of these mechanisms will render the entire act irrelevant. For example, in many states, the failure of the state governments to create appropriate authorities has resulted in the act being rendered practically useless. For example, in the case of Hemant Rath versus State of Orissa, which is a 2008 case, a public interest litigation was filed by the petitioner in the context of the evidence unearthed in the forest park area of Bhubaneswar and SCB Medical College of Katak. Here several female fetuses were found in these areas which were scattered all around suggesting that there was rampant abuse of the law relating to non-constitution of appropriate authorities and advisory authorities. The High Court directed that it is the statutory duty and the constitutional obligation of the state to create relevant bodies under a significant legislation like PCPNDT Act. Accordingly, it was made mandatory to constitute relevant bodies within a period of six weeks. This is what we discussed in relation to a social legal construction of the PCPNDT Act 
which happens to be a very important piece of legislation. It's time for us now to conclude the topic. The PCPNDT Act is based on deep-rooted social realities of India. It is one such legislation which is very intrinsically connected with the social reality of women in India. So, it talks about female feticide and prohibits the practice when it is illegal. When it is the result of the agitation against a significant social problem, its provisions have a direct impact on curtailing the practice of sex determination. Now I would like to summarize the entire module for you. So we discussed about the primary objectives of the amendment and what were the consequent ramifications of it. So the primary objective of the amendment and the consequent change of the PCPNDT Act was to ensure that advanced technologies in sex selection and sex determination are closely monitored and regulated. The most common method of abusing preconception and prenatal diagnostic techniques has been in the context of female fetuses. Section 3 of the Act states that use of PCPNDT methods is legal only for detection of the following disorders. Number 1, chromosomal abnormalities. Number 2, genetic metabolic diseases. Number 3, hemoglobinophytosis, sex-linked diseases, genetic diseases, congenital abnormalities or any other abnormalities or diseases as may be specified by the Central Supervisory Board. Section 4 of the Act laid down conditions that can make the use of preconception and prenatal diagnostic techniques legal, which are as follows. Number 1, age of the woman should be up being above 35 years. Number 2, women having undergone two or more spontaneous abortions or loss of fetus. Number 3, exposure of the pregnant woman to agents which can cause damage to the fetus like radiation, chemicals, drugs or infection. Number 4, pregnant woman's or her spouse's family history of mental retardation, physical deformities or genetic abnormalities or number 5, any other condition which is specified by the Central Supervisory Board created under the Act. Under Section 5, the PCPNDT Act makes it essential to take the written consent of the pregnant woman before conducting any preconception or prenatal diagnostic test or procedure. The Act makes the offense of misusing prenatal and preconception techniques a cognizable, non bailable and non-compoundable offense for the purpose of deterring individuals from indulging in sex selection in any form. Under this Act, there is also a bar on the communication of the sex of the fetus to any person even in the eventuality that the sex comes to the knowledge of the medical practitioner in course of the procedure or tests. The Act is thoroughly dependent on institutional mechanisms which have been established under it for its implementation. While the presence of these mechanisms uh, can render the Act a very useful device to prevent female feticide, the absence of these institutional mechanisms will render the entire act extremely irrelevant. This is what we discussed and I hope you now have a good social legal understanding of the PCPNDT Act. More later, thank you.